Thanks, Jay. Well, it's really a privilege to um, speak to this group at the sanctuary again. And I'm going to talk about some troublesome trends in IVC filter placement and show you a little bit of data even from our own institution, but moreover, just a, a glimpse of what's going on nationwide. I have no financial disclosures, but I do have a number of biases. Um, I think we put in too many IVC filters. However, I do put in IVC filters, and I guess I have to be careful because people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And I think some of my inherent bias comes from seeing many of the acute as well as the long-term complications of IVC filters. I do actually still use some greenfield filters, real greenfields. So there's been one um, large randomized control trial which has actually compared patients with filter and patients without filter. And this is a well-designed trial, I think, and it showed, uh, it was published in 2005 in circulation, and it took patients with only proximal DVTs, above the knee DVTs, uh, plus or minus pulmonary embolism, and it followed them out to eight years. And uh, of, of importance, all of these patients, both the group with the filter and without the filter, received at least a three-month course, course of anticoagulation. And later on, at least 35% of patients in each group were continued on long-term anticoagulation. So that was comparable. And there were really three important findings from this study. One was that in the filter group, let's see if I can get the laser working. And I don't know. And it's the wand. OK. This thing? Yeah. Um, so in the filter group, at about eight years uh, later, there is a significant difference between the patients who had a recurrent pulmonary embolus and those who, didn't, who, um, who did not have a filter. And, and there's a significant difference, 6.2% versus 15.1%. However, importantly, there was not a difference in fatal pulmonary embolism. And the trade-off is that patients have a higher rate of recurrent DVT in the filter group, uh, almost 10% more at this uh, long term. And you can imagine the uh, physiology and hemodynamics that may contribute to that. And finally, there's no difference between survival in the patients who received a filter or did not receive a filter. So keeping all that in mind, we need to think about the tr traditional or the, what I call the absolute indications for IVC filter placement. So those are two. One, pulmonary embolus despite adequate anticoagulation. So breakthrough pulmonary embolus. Frankly, this is rare. Number two is a contraindication to anticoagulation. That's actually a much larger group of patients. And in our own data, we had about probably 1% in the first category and probably 50% of our own patients at Roper you know, had some sort of contraindication to anticoagulation. But if you really drill down into who has a contraindication to anticoagulation, there's a lot of room for interpretation. And you know, there are very clear indications like patient has bleed in the brain or patient is having active GI bleed. But there are also um, looser indications such as patient has bleeding hemorrhoids or grandma had an ulcer in 1972 that bled. So I think we need to, when we're talking about contraindications to anticoagulation, there are real contraindications and there are perhaps questionable ones. And uh, chest uh, guidelines really had some, you know, benign uh, guidelines as well that, that help guide us not much more than, than what I just told you. And they tell us that patients that had an acute DVT, you should try to anticoagulate them. If you can't, you can put a filter in and that's okay. And if you put a filter in and they can at some point be anticoagulated, you should go ahead and do that. So that's what chest has to say on the subject of filters. So over a 20-year span, and this is data dating back from 1972 to 1999, over 20 years, there's been a 25% or 20, not 25%, 25 
fold increase in the number of IVC filters placed in the United States. And this, this trend continues, and I'll, I'll show some data in the past uh, decade. So in 2012, over 250,000 IVC filters were placed in the US. And so I guess one potential ex explanation for that would be, well, maybe the incidence of venous thromboembolism is increasing substantially. Um, that's possible, I guess. No, it's not. Um, in population-based studies, we've really shown a minimal increase or change in the incidence of venous thromboembolism over time. So we've really expanded the indication for IVC filters, and part of this is no doubt due to the availability and, and industry's availability of a number of retrievable IVC filters. So now we put them in for things like poor uh, cardiopulmonary reserve, patient noncompliance with anticoagulation, iliofemoral DVTs, iliocable thrombus, protection during surgery in patients who have a DVT, and even this last one, you know, protection during catheter-directed thrombolysis. And these are all in the Society for Interventional Radiology guidelines as, you know, acceptable indications for placement of IVC filters. Um, this last one in particular, there is a little little uh, comment about that, and this is from um, the American Venus Forum and the Society for Vascular Surgery. Uh, one of our esteemed colleagues is on this board, and um, they really uh, spoke out a, a, and made a number of guidelines about catheter-directed thrombolysis, but embedded in those guidelines is one comment about IVC filters during catheter-directed thrombolysis, and based upon the currently available evidence, they do not recommend routine use of filters with catheter-directed thrombolysis. The largest group of growing IVC filter implantation is prophylactic, and these are patients that do not currently have a DVT, and almost 50% of filters now placed nationwide are placed for prophylactic indications, and, and clearly almost all of these are going to be retrievable types of filters. So this is for indications like trauma patients who can't receive sub-Q uh, anticoagulation, uh, prophylaxis, spinal cord injury, uh, bariatric surgery, preoperative patients, patients with a history of venous thromboembolism, spine surgery, and much, much more. Uh, so uh, some of these have been looked at in institutional studies and retrospective studies, and actually there was a large meta-analysis that came out looking at trauma patients that was published in JAMA in 2014. And in that study, which, which looked at, uh, looked at a, a large group of uh, patients, obviously, it was a meta-analysis, they found that there was no reduction in mortality in patients who received an IVC filter. And moreover, in order to reduce the risk of one, eliminate one pulmonary embolus, depending on the risk stratification, you would have to place somewhere between 100 to 900 IVC filters. That's a lot of filters. And just looking at us by, by specialty, we're all putting in a lot more filters. Uh, IVC filter implantation, this is over the past decade now, has increased um, in all specialties. IR puts in the most, and they've increased. And here's vascular surgery, and down here's cardiology. So we put in a lot of filters, um, and I guess who cares? What's wrong with that? Well, the, the FDA cares, and um, and they've uh, come out with a warning uh, to physicians that we, if, if we're implanting them, we ought to probably be considering removing them when, it ref at least with regards to the uh, retrievable filters. And there were at least 921 adverse events that were reported back in in 2010, and, and surely there are many that are unreported. So if only we were as good as this lovely creature here at retrieving IVC filters. But we're not. Um, so retrievals, you know, really, we're really, really good at putting in these IVC filters, but we're not so great at retrieving them. And in this same study that showed the specialty breakdown um, in 2011, it showed that 
we're re removing about 1.2 to 5.1 percent of filters. This was based upon Medi Medicare claims data. So this is in an elderly population, and there may be some, you know, bias that some of these filters are left in, you know, permanently and are placed as retrievable filters, but are intended to be left in permanently. But again, half of them being prophylactic. Um, hard to say. So I wanted to show some um, nice pictures of some complications that I see from IVC filters, and there are a number of potential complications, and here are some of the um, estimated rates of some of these uh, complications, such as penetration, migration, and many of these complications uh, may be device dependent. So here's an example of a migration, uh, an intracardiac filter. This is a very magnified 3D reconstruction. There's the sternum. And this required a uh, sternotomy to retrieve this filter. And this is an example of another filter that's migrated with a little bit of help. Uh, this patient has a central line that was placed. And during the placement of the central line, the filter, which used to be down there, was pulled up. It uh, has a little, little hook on the top to retrieve it, and it was, it was, pla it was left in the uh, nominate vein. And here's a filter who's been in for um, at least 10 years, and this filter has evidence of a fracture and penetration of the aorta. And it has a strut that is in the right upper quadrant. And that same strut on CT imaging is lodged in the liver. Let's think about the possible ways it could have gotten there. Hmm. And um, this is my favorite, IVC filter thrombosis. This is a patient um, who's relatively young, actually, but has all these abundant collaterals across the abdominal wall and groin because his IVC filter is thrombosed. Legs aren't that swollen, though. <laughs> Here's a patient who had a calf DVT that was noted incidentally. The ultrasound was done for leg pain. The patient had leg pain because they had a herniated disc, so they needed spine surgery. Well, the spine surgeon wanted to have an IVC filter placed because he was concerned about the asymptomatic calf DVT. And one month later, the filter is uh, thrombosed all the way down the leg, and I, I suppose you could make the argument that the calf DVT propagated, but I think that's probably unlikely. Here's another uh, example of another patient of mine, and you don't see much filling here. That's because everything's thrombosed. Here's a, a trapeze filter. This is a 48-year-old obese but active man who had a pulmonary embolus um, several years prior and had a filter placed for, as best I could tell, just having a big pulmonary embolus. Um, did not have a contraindication to anticoagulation. And he was so interesting because he presented to the emergency room with this aura of back pain, terrible back pain. and you know, basically was discharged that day from the ER and came back the following day with profound phlegmasia of both legs and um, an IVC filter thrombosis and was successfully treated with extensive catheter-directed thrombolysis. So this is what I worry about because I see it every day. This is post-phlebitic syndrome. So I worry about these patients with recurrent DVTs and filter thrombosis showing up one, two, five, ten, twenty years later with their post phlebitic syndrome. So just a few slides about our own institutional data. Most of our filters are being placed for the absolute criteria, but again, there's a lot of wiggle room as to who can be, uh, what a true contraindication to anticoagulation is, in my opinion. Um, we're not placing too many prophylactic filters, but we don't have a level one trauma center, and we had a new bariatric program at the time that this, um, this study was done. Here's a group that concerns me a little bit, this 9% of other. Um, the, the other category refers to filters that I could not figure out really what the indication was for placement, so I couldn't put it in any of those three little categories. And for example, a patient who has a DVT in the leg has another DVT in the leg and gets a filter. Can be anticoagulated, no problems with it. They just, the patient that had too many DVTs needs a filter. So th there, there are some um, areas for you know, quality improvement, for sure. So we looked at 231 filters over two years, and 
Majority of filters placed were retrievable, and you know, full disclosure, I'm sure that many of these were intended to be left in permanently, um, but we only retrieved 7.1% of them, which is actually very comparable with other single institution studies in the literature, as well as what's even out there in the trauma literature and the military um, literature. Um, I do want to point out that a lot of these were, pa were placed in patients who had very limited life expectancy. So overall, in a short uh, time frame follow-up this, over this two years here and a very short time follow-up after that, almost 30% of these patients have expired. This, th the 30-day mortality of patients who receive an IVC filter at our institution is 16%. Patients who receive a filter who have active cancer or malignancy, 60% of them died within the less than two year study period. And uh, we had, a, in this very short term uh, period, we had one serious IVC filter thrombosis and one um, migration. So here are my opinionated um, thoughts about why we place so many IVC filters nationwide. Um, perhaps we don't know a lot about the data that's out there. There's maybe not as enough data out there. Uh, we have retrievable filters and we maybe have less concern about putting them in because we can always retrieve them, but we're not. Perhaps it's the past path of least resistance. It's perhaps easier to do a 10 minute procedure than to have the conversation with the family or the referring doctor about the, the, the fact that perhaps a trial of anticoagulation is in order, or, you know, maybe this isn't the, the treatment we wanna, wanna go with. It's a pretty straightforward procedure in most cases with a reasonable compensation. We may not see some of the long-term problems, such as the post syndromes and the migrations in our practices. I think there's a real fear of um, physicians that have patients with a significant DVT. They don't want their patient to die of a pulmonary embolus in the hospital. I get that. We have patients who are dying of malignancies and, and other reasons that um, perhaps are not having palliative care utilized as well as it could be. As I like to say, not every patient needs an IVC filter before they die. And finally, I think, ironically, I think many of us fear having a patient die from a pulmonary embolism or have a pulmonary embolism that may not be fatal and fear litigation from that and put an IVC filter in, you know, and then maybe think we have less to worry about, but Jeb is gonna show that perhaps we have other litigation issues to uh, worry about. So, with that in mind, we have the little clickers. Uh, everybody's got the little clickers. We have two poll questions, and I can see if I convinced you or not. Um, so we have to turn them on at the bottom. And then uh, too many IVC filters are being implanted in the US. If you agree with that, if you agree with me, A, if you disagree, B, can we like do the, how do we do that? All right, good. And then I think the second question was, we need a better we need better systems in place to improve IVC filter retrieval. And I really didn't get into that too much, but perhaps that's an opportunity for discussion coming up.